Very good. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Can we create a model and find the yes, unbalanced data? And the code should be given by the software. Yeah. So my name is so typical Dutch, it's so hard to pronounce. So, uh, but thank you anyway for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jauke Stoel, uh, which basically means chair in English, but okay. Uh, so uh, <laughs> so uh, I work at the Software uh, Analysis and Transformation Group at CWI in the Netherlands, which is the Dutch National Research Institute for Computer Science and Mathematics. And I'm here to talk about ALE-ALE, that's what is our uh, relational uh, bounded model finder. Uh, and this is joint work with Thijs van der Storm and Jurgen Fink. So before I'm gonna dive into the nitty gritty details about this uh, uh, model finder, I wanna give some background on why did we actually start this work. So some time ago, we started working on this financial specification language, a DSL, for a large Dutch national bank. And uh, the idea was that this specification language would be used by normal development teams inside this bank. Uh, so with this language, they were able to specify things like accounts, transactions, interest, all that kind of financial stuff. But one of the other things that they were very interested in is uh, a method on checking uh, properties that they uh, wanted to declare themselves on these specifications, right? And what was also very important was that, remember, these were normal development teams inside this bank. They did not have any extra training in formal proving and all of that kind of stuff. So we were looking for, let's say, a lightweight method of like doing this push button kind of verification. So that's uh, why we turned our attention to uh, Eloy and Kotkot. So I'm not sure if everybody is familiar, so let me give a very brief overview of what it is. So Alloy basically is a formal specification language, an IDE, and it combines relational logic with first order logic to write down specifications. And uh, it was started uh, about 20 years ago by Daniel Jackson uh, at MIT. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, let's say, posed as a lightweight formal method. So writing a specification in Alloy is quite straightforward. You use these nice relational constraints, and then you can push a button and check certain properties you're interested in. So what is Kotkot? Yeah, I always call Kotkot the workhorse of these two. So basically, it is the thing that takes an alloy specification and translates it down to purely set, set formula, right? And then it calls one uh, existing off-the-shelf SAT uh, solver, like set for yay or mini set or whatever you want, and uh, it translates the found results back onto uh, the, the level of alloy. So this is a very nice abstraction from this low-level SAT solving. So what we try to do is make a mapping from our financial DSL, our specification language, uh, onto this relational logic of alloy. And what we found was actually it worked pretty well. So making this mapping was quite a straightforward, so we were very happy with it. But maybe, as you can imagine, the financial domain is quite a heavy numerical domain. And since alloy and Kotkot translates to SAT, well, it's not so good in doing all kind of integer arithmetics, right? It can do it, but it quickly explodes because basically it needs to encode all integer constraints on SAT formulas. So again, we started to look around what can we do uh, uh, besides going to LIM. We thought, why not try to make a mapping directly onto FMT formulas and use FMT solvers since basically they are set solvers on steroids, right? So they have Boolean satisfiability combined with other theories like integer arithmetics. So we did that and, well, basically the integer arithmetics constraints were, worked brilliantly and it was fast. But to be honest, making a mapping from a specification language onto this SMT level, that was kind of hard. And to be totally honest, uh, I, it was, we did not complete the whole transformation. So, okay, so again, this started, uh, this got us thinking so what is, what, what can we do otherwise? 
So we went back to this whole alloy cold cold pipeline and we thought, you know what? So we have our DSL uh, on one end and we have this SMT solver on the other end. Let's do what all software engineers do, do right? Let's build a new attraction to bridge the gap between our DSL world and this SMT world. And that's basically what this Alele does, right? So um, what is it? It's a bounded relational model finder uh, and it uses God's relational algebra. So basically the algebra behind databases. Uh, and it combined first order logic and possible, possible uh, optimization criteria. Okay, maybe in an informal way you can think about it as being a, 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 a way to declare database tables and the possible tuples that uh, live in these tables and the constraints between them, right? So that's a little bit the mental model that you can use. Okay, let's just look at an example. So instead of going for the financial example, we turn to another uh, even uh, more exciting domain of politics. And we use this example from uh, uh, Dutch politics in this case. And this is the problem where we need to choose a new parliament. So uh, we had uh, elections. And as some of you might know, uh, in the Netherlands, we have a multi-party system. In this case, we have 30, 13 parties that uh, take part in parliament. And uh, in total, our parliament has 150 seats. So if you want to form a government, you need at least a majority, right? But of course, politics wouldn't be politics if not all parties got along, right? So some nice relational constraints come in here. And the inverse also uh, uh, holds because if some parties are going to rule, then they want other parties to join them, right? So it's a nice inverse of this relation. Okay, so now the question is, how can we form this new government which has the largest majority, but with the least parties, right? Because the more parties, the harder it will be to rule your country. Okay, and we can write this down in our LLA. I don't expect you to read all this, but this is basically to give you an overview of what a uh, relational uh, specification is. And I'll just highlight the different parts of it now. Uh, so the top part is where you define your relations and uh, the tuples that can live in your relation. And then this middle part, actually uh, define the constraints between these relations. And this last line uh, lets you uh, specify some optimization criteria, cri criteria if you want. Right? This is optional. You don't have to make it an optimization problem. But in this example, it's very uh, helpful. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's take a look on how to declare the re relations in a layer layer. So first off, every relation has a name, right? So it's a relational variable. In this case, we define the relation party. And then there's some header information, uh, what the, which attributes are uh, reside in this relation. And then there are some tuples. Okay, please note that this dot dot is not so much in the language, but is here to make it fit on the screen, right? So the, the, these are just other tuples like you see here, right? So they have no meaning in the language itself. Okay, the header contains the different attributes of the relation. So in this case, we have two attributes, a PID, and a seats, and this PID, all uh, attributes have a domain or a type as well. So in this case, this PID has the type ID, which is a built-in domain, but it's just a, a set of arbitrary chosen labels, and it contains exactly those values as that you use in your specification, not more than that, right? So it's just strings that you choose, but it makes modeling easy. And then this other one, this integer, uh, is basically the domain of mathematical integers as it is defined on the lower level SMT uh, level. So this maps directly onto the integers in the SMT solver. So and at this moment, uh, we only support this integer here, but with the uh, mechanisms that I'm going to talk about, we can just as well cover strings or reals or bit vectors or whatever other theories that are there in our SMT solver as long as it, uh, as it has this built-in uh, uh, reasoning uh, theory on these different types, right? Okay, and then there's one last piece that's this uh, equal sign that's basically how we define the bounds of our relation. So in this case, what we see here, the equal sign just says whatever is there on the right side, so here, that is exactly those tuples that I want in my relation. So whatever satisfying instance I'm going to find, these tuples, they must be there. So the lower is equal to the upper bound, right? But we can also uh, define it in a different way, and that's with this uh, uh, lesser than or equal sign. 
and then it lets us define the upper bound of the relation. So in this case, we say uh, satisfying instance may contain any or all or none of these tuples that are defined on the right side. Yeah? And then we can do a combination of those two where we define partly the lower bound and the upper bound. So what does defining the lower bound mean? Again, these tuples must be there in every satisfying instance. So this basically lets us encode partial solutions up front in our model that we build. So for instance, in this case, you see one of these uh, party IDs. And basically, in the Netherlands, it's customer, customary that the largest party will take par uh, part in uh, government. So that's why it's in the lower bound. OK. Now, uh, there's one other alternative. That is that uh, for integer values, instead of giving it concrete uh, instances and concrete values, we can also define it as a whole, which basically says, I don't know what values should go in here. Please, solver, find me a value that fits the constraints. Right? So, so let's look at the constraints. It's a combination of this first order logic and this COD's relational algebra. So the first order logic operators are the, the well-known operators. So we have quantification for all, exists. You can do con and disjunction, implication, that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to talk about that. But I do want to zoom in onto this relational uh, algebra. So we have the, the ALA supports all the default uh, relational algebra operators that there are. So you have projection, basically letting you projecting out certain attributes. You can do renaming of attributes. You can do restriction. So this is basically where it is an SQL query where you just say the values must adhere to some certain property. You do, can do the standard stuff like union, intersection, difference, product. And then it lets you join relations based on uh, equality of the same attribute. And the last two, we have, there is aggregation, which allows you to, uh, to uh, uh, express certain aggregations operation on your relation. So here there's count, but uh, built in our sum, average, min, max, that kind of thing. And you can also use transitive closure uh, on relations, or at least binary uh, relations. OK, let's take a look at an example. So let's say we want to express that no party can be in both government and uh, an opposition, right? Makes sense. So we can express it as follow. It's a purely relational constraint here. There's no integer reasoning needed. But uh, what we do here is we take the intersection of the government relation with the opposition, and then we force it to say, OK, this re new relation, this intersection, should not have any tuples, right? So this is the constraint. Uh, that so that we can say. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So government must hold a majority of seats. So how can we express that? So this is a little bit a longer constraint, and I'm gonna work it bottom up. So I'm gonna explain the innermost expression first. And in this case, it's this natural join. So uh, maybe you remember, or maybe not, it doesn't matter, the government relation is defined only with this PID attribute, and the party is defined with PID uh, uh, and seats attribute. So we want to reason about this seats attribute. That means that we have to join both relations. So we get a new relation for P with a PID and seats. But basically, we get all the tuples that are you know, uh, parties that are in government. So and then for this new relation, we uh, apply the aggregation. So we take a sum of all the seats that are there, and we bind it to some uh, local variable or name, in this case, TS. And then the last part is of this expression is we restrict this value to be at least larger than 75, right? And since this is pure uh, relational algebra, the result of doing a restriction is a new relation. So this sum is here to force that there are any tuples inside this result, right? Otherwise, it could be empty as well. No? OK, let's look at uh, the optimization criteria. So we want to say. We want the least number of parties with the largest majority. So we can state that by m doing a minimize of the number of tuples in this government relation. And we want to maximize the sum of the seats of all the parties that are in government. And that's basically how we express. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what I just said. OK, now uh, let's take a, a, a peek into how this translation goes. I'm not going to uh, talk about all the nitty-gritty details, but I do want to give you some intuition on what is actually happening uh, in the background. 
So, like I said, we translate this uh, relational LALA specifications to pure FMT formula, uh, and we use C3 to solve it. But we're not directly integrating with C3, but actually we're using this SMT lib, which is a general format that is well known by many uh, SMT solvers, and then uh, feed that to C3 and uh, 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 how to say, interpret the result back into our relational domain. And what we do is when you solve this, we keep the, the communication channel with C3 open. So basically it lets you iterate over new models. So you can just ask it for a new model uh, that is different from the found ones. Okay, so what happens? Uh, these LALA specifications get translated into flat SMT formula, so formula without quantifiers. So on the SMT level, it are just Boolean variables, simple com and disjunctions, and some integer uh, reasoning, but there's no quantification and, uh, being done there. So it's pretty standard uh, stuff. And then the scheme that we use is that all LALA expressions are translated into new relations, and all formula basically flatten out this relation onto uh, as an SMT formula. So let's take a look at a small example. So let's say uh, we would like to express that we don't allow for parties that hold less than 10 seats. It would pretty much render our political system useless, but okay, for this example, let's uh, go with it. So basically we can state no party where seats is less than 10. Uh, and again, we're going to do this uh, inside out. So we're going to look at the innermost expression first. So we're going to do this where, we're going to translate this where uh, restriction. So I think this slide needs some, uh, 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 some explanations. What we see here is the internal representation of a relation while we do the translation. So what we see is we see the attributes that were defined on this relation, P, ID, and seats, uh, and then with their domains, ID, and int. But we also see two new attributes, exist and add cons. And basically what exist and code is whether or not uh, these, this tuple will uh, exist uh, uh, in, uh, in a satisfying instance. And we see two different ways. So the first tuple in this example is defined as part of the lower bound. So if it's part of the lower bound, it must be there in every satisfying instance. And that's why we can just put a, a top value, a true value in this column in this uh, case. But for this bottom two, uh, these two tuples are part of the upper bound, meaning that it's up to the solver to decide whether or not they are part of the relation. So that's why they are encoded with press Boolean variables, which are basically uh, SMT variables. Uh, and then what we see here, the first two tuples have a concrete value as seats, like 20 and 9. But for the, first, uh, for the third one, uh, there was a hole introduced. So that gets encoded as a fresh integer variable into this relation, right? Okay, now let's do the translation. What happens? It takes a look at the first uh, uh, row in the relation and then it applies this constraint seats uh, uh, smaller than 10. Okay, so it adds this to the add cons uh, 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 attribute, but we can immediately see that this will never hold, so this gets rewritten into false. And then this whole tuple can be removed since it, it, this constraint can never be true. So we move on to the second one uh, and we do exactly the same thing. But in this case, we see that 9 is, will always be smaller than 10, just so we can rewrite it to a top value, a true value, and we can leave it in as it was. And then we uh, move on to the third tuple, and we do exactly the same thing, but now we have some variable here, so we just add the constraint to the add cons uh, column. Okay, and then we're done with uh, this expression part, and we move on to the formula. So remember, we said no party where seats smaller than 10, well, actually, this is syntactic sugar, and it gets automatically rewritten into negating the sum, right? Because, well, that's basically what, uh, what no means. So we're going to do the sum uh, constraint, multiplicity constraint first. So again, we start uh, at the top row, and we conjunct both the exist and the add cons uh, of uh, the first tuple. And we add that to the resulting formula. In this case, since uh, conjunction with true will always be true, so we just get the left-hand side. And since sum, the sum constraint basically forces that one of the tuples must be, uh, 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 so that the relation must at least hold one tuple, we build up a large uh, disjunction. So we move on to the second row, and uh, we basically add the conjunction of the exist and add cons uh, uh, attribute 
to the resulting formula and add it as a conjunction. And this, uh, now we are finished with translating the sum constraint. Then the last part is negating it. Well, that is very simple. Just negate the whole sound formula, right? So, and this is basically uh, what happens for all the different types of translation or the operators that we have defined. So if you're interested, all the translation rules are in the paper, or of course you can ask me. Okay, let's take a look at uh, the evaluation. Uh, so we implemented the prototype of the system in our language workbench, Resco, and to give you some rough, uh, rough idea, the total size of the translation code takes about 2,000 lines of code. And what we then did, we, uh, uh, we evaluated both the performance and the expressiveness of the language. So for the performance, we compared it with Kotkot on five different problems. And we, uh, we compared both the translation time and the solving time by the, uh, by the solver. And what we did is we ran each problem on increasing sizes. Since it's a bounded setting, the larger uh, your problem size is, so the more tuples that are there in your relation, the longer will be the translation time and the longer will be the solving time, right? So we did all these five uh, problems. I'm not gonna talk about all five. I'm just gonna highlight three of them. So the simple file system, it's purely a relational problem uh, defining some very simple file system. The helmet handshaking problem, which has both relational and cardinality constraints, and a very simple bank account management system, because in the end we were going to use this for the financial systems, and that has relational integer and cardinality constraints. Okay, let's take a look at the first one, the file system, which is a purely relational problem. So what we see here, so this is these 15 atoms just to give some idea, rough idea of the universe. Uh, we see that the translation time of Ale Ale is worse than uh, with Kotkot, but the solving time, well, this is, uh, this is just normal scale, uh, is uh, comparable. So if we increase the universe size, well, yes, it gets worse and Kotkot really performs well. It's a very, very efficient and well-engineered piece of software. So if we're going to look at problems which have, have both this relational and, for instance, cardinality constraints on those relations, we start to see a different picture. So again, for small universes with a, a small bit width, so this bit width here is needed for Kotkot because you have to tell it how large the integer numbers are that it can actually generate, right? So this bit width has no value for a lay, lay because for us it's just infinite integers. The SMG solver is not, uh, doesn't care, but it is important for Kotkot since it needs to basically uh, generate for all possible integers. So still for what some, some smaller uh, uh, examples, um, uh, Ale Ale uh, performs uh, worse, but if we increase the universe size, then we see that the translation time uh, is overtaken by actually the solving time. So in this case, uh, the Z3 is much quicker in being able to solve this combined problem. And now uh, clearly Kotkot and the sub solver is uh, having problems. And this gets even worse if we really do integer constraints in our uh, specifications. So here, uh, also for small universes, we see that our uh, combined solver uh, uh, works uh, quicker, and it gets worse if we increase the universe size. Okay, and also we did a, a small evaluation on the expressiveness. What we did is we encoded the optimal dependency resolution problem in Ale Ale. Basically, that's the problem that the package managers solve on our system. So we have some configuration. We want to install or remove some packages, and we want to basically minimize uh, the changes to our system. And actually, there used to be a solver competition uh, that ran up until 2012, where they actually compared different solvers that solved this problem. And what we did is we took all these uh, problems and we uh, built a, a LLA specification and ran, uh, uh, ran basically solved this uh, package problem. So what we found, again, don't read this, but this is the constraints that are needed, uh, and, and, but it is also all the constraints that are needed to encode this problem. And in total, it were about 44 lines of code, so it's like 30 lines on constraint, 14 on relation definitions. And all the found solutions were both correct and optimal. So compared with this uh, uh, benchmark, uh, they were uh, in, uh, exactly the same. And again, we saw that translation time could be improved, but the SMT solving times, uh, they were actually on par with uh, what we saw there in, uh, in the benchmark. 
Okay, so to conclude, uh, Ale Ale, that is our uh, new take on the relational model finding utilizing SMP solvers. Uh, you can express problems using first order logic and cause relational algebra. Uh, although translation uh, uh, can see improvement, we see that actually the solver uh, can pretty much often efficiently solve the problems uh, that are generated. With that, it's the end of my presentation. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. That's, oh, sorry, that's only there for Copco, right? So it's not a constraint for Alay Alay, since it just, you can just use any sized integer. Right, but basically even for uh, a Dutch parliament, which is a relatively small parliament, yep. uh, on Copco, this is not applicable at all. It's, it's no. You would, you would do it for the size of your parliament, that would be too easy. Well, it would or take a longer time, but also another thing is that in our alloy and cop cop, natively you can't express optimization problems, right? So it doesn't allow for optimization criteria, so you can't express this problem natively, right? Since it is an optimization problem, yeah. right? So it, you can encode it up until the optimization criteria, leave that out, but then basically you have to iterate over all the models yourself and do the optimization on the all defined models. So. But If you want to do optimization, it won't solve the problem out of the box, right? And, and another uh, question is um, the green bar, so the second time, mm -hmm. is it still blue when you switch from four abyss to five bits? Yes, definitely. So, uh, how, does it come, how does it fit with your statement that it doesn't matter for uh, the layer? Well, in this case, it was a problem which has both relational constraints and integer constraints. So, and probably as you know, uh, at some point, solvers will break, right? So, and it's very hard to predict upfront, like if they can still efficiently solve a problem or whether it, where it will just blow up, right? And in this case, the constraints that were generated uh, were a hard problem for it to find. So, also C3 will have a hard problem of uh, finding a solution. But it can reason natively on this integer constraint, so it doesn't at least have to. So the number of variables that it needs to actually encode the problem are much less, right? And that has impact, quite a large impact on solving times. Yes, uh, so uh, I did not talk about it, but what we also did is compare it on a little bit on Choco, so it's another constraint solver, right? Uh, and then just check whether or not the things that you could express in a Choco constraint problem, could you also express it in a LLA, and would they find the same solutions? And the answer so far is yes. <laughs> but what you, so I'm not an expert on uh, constraint programming, but in constraint programming, if you want to express a problem, you need to adhere to the primitives of the constraint programming uh, solver that you use, right? So if you can encode your problem exactly in those idioms that the constraint uh, programming system uh, gives you, then it's often very, very efficient. So for the, what is it, uh, uh, like, like um, um, sorry? For all different, exactly. So it has built-in things, heuristics to do this kind of thing, right? So. Yes, but uh, I think on expressiveness level, it is very much comparable. 